Good to go? Right. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, you're joining Code Pink and the Party for Socialism and Liberation uh, in solidarity with the Venezuelan people and Nicolas Maduro, the rightful president of Venezuela. Um, yes, uh, you know, we're being told that Venezuela uh, doesn't have democracy and, and that, uh, you know, Donald Trump and, and the Democrats uh, you know, care so much about the Venezuelan people and uh, human rights and democracy, but um, we know that's not true. We've, uh, you know, Americans have been told time and time again that, uh, you know, our democracy is in Iraq and it's in Libya, it's in Syria, but uh, time and time again we find that uh, things things aren't changing. There, there are more cops on the street, there are more uh, video cameras recording us on every corner block. There are more people experiencing homelessness right here in D.C. So, um, you know, we have more in common with the people in Venezuela, the working people of Venezuela, as working class Americans. And uh, we want to show our solidarity today, so I think we can uh, get started with some chants. Uh, so why don't we start off with hands off Venezuela, hands off Venezuela. Hands off Venezuela, 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 hands off Maduro si, 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 Trump no, Trump no, Trump no, Trump no, Yankee no. So, uh, the last, oh, it's Brian. Brian. So first we're going to have Brian from the Answer Coalition that's uh, Act Now to Stop War and End Racism. We're going to have Brian Beck from the Answer Coalition speak. Brian. Thank you. I want to, I also want to tell everyone that the next 48 hours are certainly going to be critical hours. The fact that the Venezuelan government has broken relations with the United States and ordered the U.S. Embassy personnel to leave Caracas is certainly within their legal right. They are the sovereign government. They are the recognized government. They are the government that sits at the United Nations. But Trump and the Trump administration, using all of their arrogance, has said Maduro has no right to break relations with the U.S. government because Maduro is, in fact, not the government in Venezuela. So that sets the stage for a confrontation because if the Maduro government moves to expel these diplomats as they've demanded within a 72-hour period, and that started yesterday, the U.S. will then assert that the Venezuelan government is carrying out an act of aggression against American military personnel. And I believe that will be used as a triggering event for a larger direct intervention by the U.S. or the U.S. and its allies, the ultra-right governments in Latin America. So the next 48 hours, in fact, are critical. <clears throat> this is, I think it's pretty unprecedented. I don't remember this in my lifetime. I've seen many coup d'etats led by the CIA in my lifetime, but where the U.S. government just declares that the sovereign government is no longer the government and announces that they've picked a new president, a new leader, and that the old government, which is really the existing government, has no right to tell the American government to leave its capital, that's unprecedented. It's really, uh, truly remarkable. You would think that the Democratic Party opposition to Trump, the so-called resistance to Trump, would make a big deal out of this interfering in and colluding with foreigners to 
mess up somebody else's election. But there's been a virtual silence because if Trump succeeds in this illegal act to overthrow the elected government of Venezuela, I believe it will win the applause of the Democratic Party elites who oppose Trump on every other thing except perhaps bombing Syria, which they also think is a great presidential act. So we're in a, we're in a showdown. Venezuela has been basically put up against the wall. And should they do what they have the right to do, which is to expel American diplomats, we can expect that this will, in fact, be a catalyst or a trigger for the next round of military and CIA operations to topple that government. So we're asking people, given the critical nature of the next 48 hours, to come together here, we hope with better weather, on Saturday at 1 p.m. at the White House. We hope the different organizations will tell their networks that each of us on Facebook or Twitter or whatever media platforms we're using will spread the word. Uh, we're at a grave and critical moment. And I want to just finish by just putting this a little bit in historical perspective as well. John Bolton made a speech about the troika of tyranny, new little catchphrase, meaning Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Cuba are now in the crosshairs for regime change. Venezuela is number one. John Bolton in the Bush administration in 2002, January, said it wasn't a troika of tyranny. They called it an axis of evil. And they announced Iraq and Iran and North Korea were that axis. Again, they, they, uh, they like to figure in, in uh, magnitudes of three, apparently. The troika of tyranny, the axis of evil. But then the Bush administration proceeded to wipe out the Iraqi government. Again, they used noble-sounding reasons for it, like stopping weapons of mass destruction. They always assign some noble cause to an imperial intervention. And that was at the moment with the DPRK, North Korea said, okay, if we're part of the Axis and one of the legs of the Axis just is invaded, we're going to leave the NPT and get nuclear weapons, which of course they did. Now we're in a sim similar situation. If the U.S. succeeds in Venezuela, if they should, you have to know with certainty that Cuba and Nicaragua are next. Right. The troika of tyranny isn't simply a catchphrase. It's an indicator of what governments are in the crosshairs of the U.S. government. The pity here is that when Trump, I mean, when Bush and Bolton and that gang did this to Iraq, Millions of Americans came into the streets. We were activists. We were in the streets month after month. We built a movement that was global in character. Right now, the Democratic Party that's leading the so-called opposition to Trump is doing so in such a way so as to tell people don't care about Venezuela, or don't care about Cuba, or don't care about Nicaragua, or don't care about Syria, or don't care about war. Just bring down Donald Trump and some other basis. That takes out the, the progressive aspect of the struggle against Trump, which is to reject all of Trump's reactionary policies, not to cherry pick and say, oh, yeah, we don't like what's going on at the wall, with the wall, but we, we, we're going to either be supportive or apathetic about this imperialist intervention in Latin America. We, we have to do better than that. We have, to, we have to be better than that. We have to say what we know is true. We have to say it as loud as we can. We have to organize. Again, as I mentioned, the next 48 hours are critical. So please, everyone, join us. I just talked to Medea and Code Pink. I think we'll also mobilize in other groups for Saturday, 1 p.m. here at the White House. Let's, last night, we had a good crowd uh, on short notice at the Venezuelan embassy. Let's do that and more for Saturday. Long live Venezuela, long live its independence, its sovereignty. Let's stop U.S. imperialism. Let's stop a government that speaks in our name, but certainly, certainly without our consent. Hands off Venezuela! Hands off!
bombas ya no más guerra, queremos paz en esta tierra. Ya no más bombas, ya no más guerra, queremos paz en esta tierra. Paz, queremos paz. Paz, queremos paz y libertad en este mundo. Pararararam. bombas con radiación, no más ideas de exterminación, ya no más bombas con radiación, no más ideas de exterminación. Paz, queremos paz y libertad en este mundo. Your last chance to sing the chorus. Paz, queremos paz. talk about the masses of people who came out in the lead up to the Iraq war and uh, some of you are too young to have been part of that but we got a lot of people out on the streets and these are different times and it's really hard to mobilize people around foreign policy issues we see lots of people coming out for domestic issues and that's important but in the meantime we have these horrendous things going on in the world Now, around the Middle East, most people are like, oh, that's been going on for over 17 years now, you know, so what? Um, well, you know, so what? There are millions of people who have been harmed by these uh, wars that we've been involved in. Right. And we also have the U.S. now putting its sights on Iran, which is one country in the region that it really wants to change. But... You know, some people said that the silver lining of the U.S. involvement in the Middle East is that they didn't have time to uh, put their attention and, and, and sights on Latin America. And during that the, the number of years, there were some really great, um, what they call the pink tide in Latin America, with progressive governments coming to power. And I remember we'd look around the world and say, well, you know, at least there's Latin America and all the positive things that are going on there. And it's not just, it's not ideology. It's not, oh, you know, a bunch of leftist governments, some of themselves calling themselves socialists. It's what they were doing in Latin America. And what they were doing is massive redistribution of wealth, massive redistribution of land, uh, resources going to poor families, encouraging them to be able to send their kids to school, Uh, all kinds of positive things that led to a huge reduction in poverty in Latin America. And now we see the pink tide turning into a very ugly tide of right-wing fascist governments. It's so heartbreaking to see in Brazil what has happened when you had the uh, progressive governments there that were in the lead in uh, the redistribution of wealth now being taken over by a fascist like Bolsonaro who wants to uh, not only redistribute wealth back upwards, but also is ready to destroy the environment for the sake of privatization and more profits. And you had Venezuela that was holding the line and holding the line and helping other governments in Latin America uh, by economic arrangements and something called ALBA, which was a coalition of progressive governments that helped to redistribute the wealth. Uh, and one by one, those governments are falling, and what you have left is a very small number. We do have the positive uh, development in Mexico, where you have a progressive government coming to power in Mexico, and that government is one of the few that is saying we will stand behind Nicolas Maduro and not recognize this unelected government of Juan Guido. Uh, but unfortunately, there's all too few in Latin America these days. And so we have the really strange situation where Trump is saying he's getting out of Syria, wants to pull the troops out of Afghanistan, well, this frees up some 
uh, uh, troops and, and uh, the Pentagon right. to put his sights towards Latin America and particularly towards Venezuela. Uh, I think we have to recognize that Venezuela has been in a crisis for a number of years now, and it is really heartbreaking how the economic situation has affected the ordinary people. A lot of it is government mistakes, a lot of it is sabotaged by their own uh, right wing, and a lot of it is from U.S. intervention and U.S. sanctions. But it's created the perfect storm uh, that gives the U.S. a chance now to do what it's wanted to do for a long time. And I was just had a chance to go into the Organization of American States about an hour ago when uh, Mike Pompeo was giving his speech to say how much he cares for the people of Venezuela and how important it is at this moment that we recognize the true government of Juan Guido and not the elected government of Nicolas Maduro. And it really is quite astonishing. And what you saw in that room was a lot of puppets of the United States because the OAS has been used for a long time as puppets of the United States. And so they're clapping for, uh, for Mike Pompeo as he is giving one of the most imperial speeches to say that it doesn't matter to us that millions of people elected Maduro and that the opposition was so divided that they couldn't put up a good opposition to get rid of him electorally. And so we're going to do it in the tried and true way of uh, a coup. And so um, it is unfortunate that we can't get out the masses of American people now to say no to a coup. But we do have to keep building up our numbers here. And we do have to keep um, people aware of the, uh, the true narrative that's not being given to us in the media and not even being shown to us. We saw huge demonstrations against Maduro taking place this week in Venezuela, and that's true. And we should see those demonstrations. But we don't see the huge demonstrations in support of Maduro. That one we're not seeing. And, you know, we're told this is not a class or a race issue. But if you look at who is going to those demonstrations, you'll see a lot of white faces at the ones for Guido and a lot of people of color at the ones from Maduro. This is certainly a class and a race issue. So let's recognize that this is happening in real time in our lifetimes. Right. And let's not wait till we come 10 or 20 years down the road and say, I remember when the U.S. instituted that coup in Venezuela. This coup is not a done deal. Right. The military is still with the Maduro government, mm -hmm. and there are millions and millions of people that are still with this Maduro government. So this is the time for us to act, not wait until it's too late to say no to a coup in Venezuela and say, hands off Venezuela, 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 hands off Venezuela. Hands off Venezuela! 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 All right, next we're gonna have Eugene Perrier speak. Eugene from the Answer Coalition again. Well, thank you, Kay. I appreciate it. You know, thank you to everyone who came out here today, and I look forward to seeing all of you and many more on Saturday at 1 p.m. I'm sorry I couldn't be there yesterday evening, but thank you to everyone who was also there in front of the Venezuelan embassy against this um, just extraordinary, extraordinary uh, attempted coup that the United States is trying to facilitate. There, there are a couple levels we have to look at this issue on. And the first level is... Why is the United States even claiming any sort of moral 
capability to weigh in on anything Venezuela is doing. They're saying this is a illegitimate government. It's a fraudulent government. The elections were frauds. Saudi Arabia has no elections. Uh, Bahrain has no elections. Qatar has no elections. Afghanistan had two elections that were so fraudulent that even though the United States uh, recognized them, the second one they said, well, it wasn't really real, but what else can we do? So we're just going to stick with this government. I mean, over and over and over again, we see the United States government doesn't care about elections, doesn't care about the outcome of elections. I mean, certainly you look at the Democratic Republic of Congo right now, that is certainly a disputed election. 40,000 election observers, 40,000 said, well, what happened isn't what really happened. Well, did the U.S. say anything there? No, they said, you know, good process. Are they sanctioning them? Are they invading them? Are they uh, saying that this is an economic basket case of a country, even though it is? You have to look at it at that level first and foremost, because so many people are asking, well, what about this policy of the government? And I'll get to that. What about that policy of the government? And I'll get to that. But we have to ask, what is it about the policies of this government that say that they get to decide who is real and who is Ill illegitimate? Right. What is democratic and what is not democratic? What is uh, allowed and what will be crushed and snuffed? Uh, before it is able to flower. I think that's unbelievable. This country shouldn't be the police force of the world telling every single other person what to do. And if we want to address human rights, let's deal with the 40 million people living in poverty in the United States. Let's deal with the fact that in every major city, uh, affordable housing is in a crisis situation. Not a problem, but a crisis situation. That the police are shooting down 1,000 black people every single year, and yet they have absolutely and complete impunity. I mean, we could go on and on. There's 50 51 million people who cannot meet their daily expenses. The average person couldn't produce $400 in an emergency. You've got voter suppression in Georgia. In Oklahoma, you had Chris Kobach, who was one of the president's closest allies, purge 3 million people from voter rolls in the United States of America. And we're talking about other countries not being democratic? You know, everyone talking about, well, Jeb Bush, this, that, and the third, he was a moderate. Don't forget that he was the one in 2000 who ignored two federal court injunctions to stop purging voters from Florida. Never did a day in jail. Those voters remained purged, and they stole the election in 2000 using those procedures. No one in the United States should be saying anything at all. We can go in the voting lines in Ohio in 2004. Every single election marred with irregularities, yet this is the country that's going to preach to other countries. This is the country that will say we will support an absolute monarchy that will assassinate a teenager by cutting their head off with a sword, but somehow an elected government with 8 million votes is illegitimate. So we have to start right there. Yeah. I think secondarily what we have to make 100% clear is, is what is in fact actually happening and what this is really about. What it's about is Venezuela has a lot of oil, it has a lot of money, and instead of like Colombia, instead of like the new government in Brazil, instead of like the, the governments of places like Equatorial Guinea, where all that wealth goes to these U.S. funded and backed oligarchs who live high off the hog in the first arrondissement in Paris and in New York City and in London and all of these fancy places where they hide their billions of dollars. The Bolivarian movement came in in 1998 and said, no, we're, we're going to change that around. And instead of 20% of the people controlling 80% of the wealth, we're going to have 80% of the people control 75% of the wealth. 73% of the budget in Venezuela goes to social programs. 73%. 73%. That's what we can do here. Standing right here in Washington, D.C., so-called welfare, temporary aid uh, uh, for uh, needy families, TANF, you know, the TANF families in, 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 in D.C., $13 billion a year budget, get only 60% of the poverty line. So even though we could afford it, we are allowing children to live in poverty in the nation's capital. Okay. You're looking at a, a country of Venezuela that cut extreme poverty in half. That as recently as 2015, the uh, FAO said had almost eliminated hunger. But we also know it's basically a one-crop oil economy. The oil economy has gone south. Sanctions are being put on the economy. There's all sorts of sabotage from the private businesses. So, of course, some of these things have deteriorated. When you extend health care to all people and make it a right in the Constitution, you got to pay for it. If you pay for it in one way and that goes down, there are going to be problems. we got to put the 
the problems in context. The reason that the government is overextended is because they extended so many positive benefits to so many people because instead of denying them, they said, we're going to practice social justice, not populism, not welfare politics, not Cadillism, or whatever they want to call it, social justice. The wealth produced in the country will lift up the people of the country. The United States, of course, doesn't want that in its backyard. They have targeted every country in the history of countries that's ever tried to make people-centered policies their, their centerpiece moving forward. And I just want to close on this question. For those who are confused about why domestic issues and foreign policy issues are connected, here it is right here. If you say you want to have housing as a right for all people in the United States, recognize that Venezuela is a country that, in just since 2011, has built two and a half million low-cost to free houses and wants to build five million by 2025 and has actually already renovated over one million of those homes. So why would you not want to have solidarity with such a country? You talk about voting rights. This is a country that Jimmy Carter said, I've looked at elections in 92 countries. Venezuela has the best electoral system. So we're saying, how do we secure the vote in Georgia? Why would you not want to have solidarity with Venezuela? I mean, this is a country that has stood up for the progressive ideals that so many of us claim to stand for day in and day out, and many of us do. And if we aren't willing to stand with those across any border that exists, around the same values, we will lose. Because those who are supporting these right-wing fascist coups, the Wall Street bankers, the ultra-rich corporations, they are moving and meeting all around the world. What is Davos about? For them to all get together and figure out how they're going to keep everyone else down. So we got to all get together and figure out how we're going to lift everyone else up. So I thank Code Pink. I thank all of my fellows here from the Answer Coalition, the Party for Socialism and Liberation, just concerned citizens and community members, everyone who is out here last night, today, and will be here again 1 p.m. on Saturday saying hands off Venezuela. Hands off Venezuela! Venezuela.